Gord Naylor uh, is, has been instrumental in creating, developing, and implementing programs for the education and empowerment of youth and families. And this is not only uh, Canadian youth and families. This goes very far from China to Brazil, from Europe to South America. These are, if there is a youth who needs advancement, one phone call to Gord will take care of it. Uh, he has established a school which, the word school will not define what he's doing and what that school is. We are all very grateful to Gord for what he has done in, in Ontario and for the world. As far as his education is concerned, uh, this is redundant, but he has completed graduate studies in international education, clinical psychology, and educational administration. I just wanted to add this sentence about him, and that is <clears throat> Ward has beautiful children, just amazing daughters and grandchildren and a wonderful son and all of that. And there's no dispute about that. But Gord is the father to whoever needs it. And by this, I would like to welcome Mr. Gordon Naylor. Please unmute. I was just saying, if you ever need somebody to promote you, Baruz Day is the person. <laughs> but the expectations might rise so high that you might be overwhelmed. But we'll just start out simple. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's great to see so many people here. And I really thought that the subject, because we're approaching this season where people become, uh, I hope, more open to qualities of the spirit and I think want to make others feel happy. Hopefully that happens all year round, but we all know that it is a, this is a time of cheer, but it's also a time in the world right now where some pretty horrific things are happening and it's, um, it's hard to think about whether or not one could experience joy when so many people are suffering so tragically in the wars that are going on and the difficulties that are happening. And one might even start to wonder, um, you know, how people could remain hopeful or how people could remain uh, joyful when we see our brothers and sisters suffering so much. And I think in the future, um, some of these things that are happening will, and even in the present, would be regarded as pretty barbaric and almost impossible to imagine. And so for those of us who aren't experiencing those things, um, I think, uh, I think it's, it is mostly our imagination I, I, uh, that we are dealing with. But if we've had hardship in our life, which I believe everybody has had in one way or another, uh, then we relate to that suffering and hopefully our prayers will alleviate some of that suffering. So this challenge of how to uh, bring ourselves um, to a joyful state, it's interesting to think about um, how powerful our human mind is. And, you know, our mind actually is an interesting um, instrument that each of us has and it's, it's interesting because, you know, if you ask it a question, it will produce a lot of answers for you. Um, so we have to be careful what questions we ask it or what we tell it. Um, and sometimes I think we are not so aware of the fact that we are creating our own uh, moods or our own uh, responses when in reality it's how we perceive things that really affect our emotions. And it's really how we think about them. And there's ways of thinking about uh, suffering and difficulties that ultimately result in 
um, progress. And there's ways of thinking about things that cause us to feel more and more helpless. Um, and I, I, you know, we have those choices all the time as we face, as we face difficulties and as the world faces difficulties, whether it's in our personal life. Uh, today, I had so many things happen that I did not expect to have happened. Um, and many of them brought me to the question of joy and uh, sorrow or difficulties, because we find ourselves dealing with things that we thought maybe we were, um, you know, we've escaped dealing with. So, you know, many things, life brings many things to our doorstep. And uh, it's interesting that uh, life is defined as, um, as motion in the Baha'i writings. And it's kind of a fascinating idea to think about life being motion. And that through motion, we're, we're always moving and we're hopefully moving forward and hopefully moving in a progressive way. But it would seem like everything in creation has been designed to be developmental. And, you know, it doesn't matter what uh, being you're looking at or what plant or what um, mineral, everything develops from one stage to another and it's in a state of constant motion. The speed of the motion may vary, but all of us are subject to this motion. And there's no real way to stop the motion um, because it just keeps going forward. And in actual fact, um, life becomes this, uh, this challenge of us wielding motion and keeping ourselves moving forward at all times. Um, and I feel like uh, this subject tonight, Joy Gives Us Wings, is from a quotation of Abdul Baha, which probably the Baha'is amongst us would recognize. Um, and Abdul Baha says, joy gives us wings. In times of joy, our strength is more vital. Um, our intellect is keener and our understanding is less clouded. We seem better able to cope with the world and to find our sphere of usefulness. And I really like that term of finding our sphere of usefulness. If it is um, our intention to be of service uh, to others around us in, in the community building process, then this is something that we are constantly assessing and reassessing. What is my sphere of usefulness and what can I contribute and how can I help things become better? But when sadness visits us, Abdul Baha says, we become weak. Our strength leaves us. Our comprehension is dim and our intelligence is veiled. The actualities of life seem to elude our grasp and the eyes of our spirits fail to discover the sacred mysteries and we become even as dead beings. So the condition of, um, let's say our opposite choice of being joyful is not very attractive. Um, ultimately it means, uh, you know, we're in some kind of motion and I think it's sometimes it's a little bit fascinating to think that we always have choices, you know, like we are, uh, according to the Baha'i teachings, we are noble beings, created noble. But what gives us our nobility or what ensures our nobility is this aspect of having free will. Um, that human beings must have free will. And the reason we must have free will is because we were created to have it. But to, to wield the power of free will is the, you know, the essence of education is to help us learn how to wield the power of free will. And we always have choice between um, what I, I always tell the students at the school. We have we, every moment we're choosing between vice and virtue. Those are the two that we're choosing before. Uh, you know, we're either we're either going to demonstrate some virtues and qualities in what it is we're being challenged with, or we're going to choose, when I say vice, I mean something that probably is somewhat self-destructive or perhaps somewhat destructive to others around us. But it's always really the same challenge. And so in a way, we could simplify our life a lot more if we would just be asking ourselves, okay, so what are the virtues I need to be demonstrating now? I had an interesting phone call today to talk to, from someone who said that she's teaching an Arabic, she's teaching Arabic to a Romanian uh, 
student. This person came to Canada when she was about four or five. And um, when she was that young, she she came to Canada, but now she's a lawyer in her forties. And she was telling her teacher that she, um, she had become interested in the Muslim faith. Uh, and she had been Christian, but she found, she felt that the Muslim faith may have some more answers for her. And of course this teacher was a Baha'i. So she said, well, that's uh, interesting. And, you know, she mentioned that she was a Baha'i and the woman said, oh, I knew a Baha'i. So she started talking about this one person she knew that was like an angel. And she said she was an angel. And, and so my friend didn't say much more to her, but said that was, you know, nice. And then she said, but she passed away. And um, it's a, just an interesting story because um, later on she talked more and the lady became more interested in wanting to know more about what were the teachings. And she talked about progressive revelation and different messengers of God and how we, um, you know, we accept all the messengers of God and that the most recent messenger is Baha'u'llah. And so again, this woman mentioned this, uh, this Baha'i that she met. And so she said, well, who was this person? She said, oh, her name was Brandy. Um, but she died when she was 18. And she said, well, how did you have a connection with her? And she said, well, you know, she was five years old when she came to, when we were in Canada and she came ringing our bell at the door and we were all scared of what was happening in the community and whether they'd be able to fit in and so on. And she said, this little five-year-old kept ringing the doorbell and she wouldn't stop until we came out. And she said, and then she wanted to be our friend and she became my friend because she was also about five. And she said, and she was just like this wonderful angel. And so she said she got to know her and every, uh, every association was this friendship. And she said, I'll never forget her qualities. And so um, then the reason this person was calling me is she found out that her name was Brandy Elliott. And it turned out it was my sister's daughter who was killed in a car accident when she was 19. Um, but this girl, um, this girl remembered her when she was five because of her qualities and saw her as an angel. And I feel like as I was hearing the story, I was thinking, it's so fascinating. I don't know that I would have thought that a five-year-old's qualities would have had such a profound effect on another human being. But it does speak to this whole issue of what is the power of character and what is the power of demonstrating virtue in times of difficulty. Baha'u'llah says so powerful is the light of a good character that it can illumine the whole earth. So in a way, it's probably each of our tasks to try to figure out how do we reach inside of ourselves in time of difficulty and reach to the, that reflection of the qualities of the creator. Abdul Baha goes on to say here, there is no human being untouched by these two, by these two influences, but all the sorrow and the grief that exist come from the world of matter. The spiritual world bestows only the joy. So it's a very interesting uh, dichotomy that's created uh, in a very, very direct way. That if we start thinking about all of those things that cause us sorrow and difficulty, they have to do with the tests of this world. And this world is the world of time and space. So all of them can be reduced to issues of time and space. But these tests are very, very overwhelming when we're going through them because these feel like very powerful realities. But Abu Baha's saying here that in actual fact, um, in the spiritual realm, there are no, uh, there, these are not, there, there is no test. He goes on to say, he gives certain examples, but then he says, all these examples are to show you that the trials which beset our every step all our sorrow, pain, shame, and grief are born in the world of matter, whereas the spiritual kingdom never causes sadness. A man living with his thoughts in the kingdom knows perpetual joy. The, the ills that all flesh causes air to, to um, they do not pass by him, but they only touch the surface of his life the depths 
are calm and serene. So it's kind of an interesting thing to start to think about the fact that although it may seem extremely painful and to outward, uh, to outward appearances, um, they are, but internally we have this um, reservoir of calm and serenity that's inside of us. And when our thoughts are filled with the bitterness of this world, he says, let us turn our eyes to the sweetness of God's compassion and he will send us heavenly calm. So that's kind of the creator's commitment to us, that if we can turn ourselves away from the things of this world, then the sweetness of God's compassion will cause us to feel heavenly calm. So if we are imprisoned in the material world, our spirit can soar into the heavens and we shall be free indeed. So we always have this place. And then, you know, he goes on to say um, that I myself was in prison for 40 years. One year alone would have been impossible to bear, he says. Nobody survived that imprisonment more than a year. But thank God, during all those 40 years, I was supremely happy. Every day on waking, it was like hearing good tidings. And every night, infinite joy was mine. Spirituality was my comfort. And turning to God was my greatest joy. If this had not been so, do you think it possible that I could have lived through those 40 years of in prison? So, I mean, this, these words are like, um, he says, thus spirituality is the greatest of God's gifts and life everlasting means turning to God. May you one and all increase daily in spirituality. May you be strengthened in all goodness. May you be helped more and more by the divine consolation be made free by the Holy Spirit of God and may the power of the heavenly kingdom live and work among you. So this is really taking us into a very directly and um, probably powerful set of language that we don't hear very often in our world today and in an unbelieving world, uh, even the mention of God can seem quite unusual. And so it's not always easy to introduce uh, the idea that we in order for us to actually experience perpetual joy, we have to develop this capacity of our free will um, to be able to turn in the direction of God. In many of the Baha'i prayers, it talks about turning thy face to my face, you know, turning our face to God. And it's interesting that when we're in the greatest times of difficulty, very often we find, you know, we find ourselves um, struggling to do that, almost like we don't believe it anymore because the world has showed us such ugliness or difficulty that we somehow feel like we might have lost our faith. Um, and it reminds me of like, how do we, how do we kind of retrain our mind in an unbelieving world to know that yes, it's going to have to be that we can reach to that state of spiritual joy. I remember once my sister came to visit me when I was living in Guyana and we were going on this boat that was going to take us over a bunch of waves. And so we got out in the water and the boat was really going up and down and she was just panicking, you know, and I said, Holly, you have to sit down there and you have to become calm. Everything's going to be all right. And I remember <laughs> she looked at me and she said, because she knew I studied psychology, she said, there's a time for psychology and there's no time for psychology. And this is not the time for, psych for psychology. <laughs> and I thought that was like, you know, the abandoning of all beliefs that, <laughs> that might be helpful. I said, well, actually, that's all we have here. We, we have no control over the boat. We have no control over the waves. Whatever's going to happen to us, we're going to have to condition our mind to be able to accept the conditions and leave it in the hands of God and move forward. That's the way it's going to have to go. So I said, you just might as well be calm because that's all we got. And so she got calm after that. But I, th I think that that was sort of indicative. You know, it reminds me, I think maybe I've told a few of you this joke, but I always like this joke where the monk is going through the, the, um, the monastery and he's taken a vow of silence and he's walking along and he falls over a cliff. 
And as falling down, he falls about 50 feet and he grabs a hold of a root of a tree and he just manages to stop himself from falling the additional 150 feet to, the, to his death. And he's hanging on to this root and then suddenly he realizes that he has taken this vow of silence, that he wasn't going to say anything. And he's trying to think, well, how on earth am I going to get out of this? So he decides God surely doesn't want him dead. So he, you know, he yells out, is there anybody up there? help, help, is there anybody up there? And this voice answers and just says yes in a calm manner. And he's, you know, his hands are getting tired from hanging on and he's worried about what's happening. And he said, well, can you help me? And the voice said, yes. And he still waits and there's no instruction, nothing coming. And he's just about out of strength. And so he says, well, what must I do? And he said, who is this? And the voice says, it's God. Well, that suddenly puts a little silence in him because he's not sure on what side of God he's on at this point. So he was not faithful enough to keep his vow of silence, but he figures God's got to be merciful. So he says to him, you know, can you help me? What must I do? And God said, let go of the branch. So he looks down and it's about 150 feet and he looks up and it's 50 and he thinks for a few minutes. And then he says, is there anybody else up there? So this is kind of the way we react to the guidance of God in times of difficulty. We're checking out our options. We're not so sure that we were going to go with the first plan. Um, but the fact of the matter is the instructions remain the same of how we reach to a state of joy. And that's by turning ourselves uh, to a spiritual outcome. Outcome. There's a couple of things that the writings talk about that actually give us joy or should give us joy. And I thought they might be interesting for us to hear. Um, and at the advent of this manifestation, the realities of all created things were filled with joy. So whenever a manifestation of God comes, uh, everything is filled with joy and all sees the cup of ecstasy with the hands of longing and rapture and drank thereof the choicest wine for the love of this beauty, a beauty that hath appeared through the power of truth, arrayed with the ornament of God. So something that should always give us joy is the fact that we continually get this guidance from the creator, this guidance about how to live life on this planet and in the future. And that guidance, as much as we can bring ourselves to choose to follow it, will protect us and will give us what it is that is needed. But certainly, as Abdu'l-Bahá pointed out in his 40 years of being imprisoned, he said most people couldn't last a year, but he had been imprisoned for 40 years. And the way he had done that was by developing this capacity to turn to what is spiritual. But Baha'u'llah goes even farther when he talks about his relationship to sorrow um, and joy. And he said, this is actually one of my favorite quotations. He says, the ancient beauty hath consented to be bound with chains that mankind may be released from its bondage and hath accepted to be made a prisoner within this most mighty stronghold that the whole world may attain unto true liberty. He hath drained to its dregs the cup of sorrow, that all the peoples of the earth may attain unto abiding joy and be filled with gladness. This is the mercy of your Lord, the compassionate, the most merciful. We have accepted to be abased, O believers in the unity of God, that ye may be exalted and have suffered manifold afflictions that ye might prosper and flourish. He who hath come to build anew the whole world, behold how they have joined partners with God, have forced him to dwell within the most desolate of cities. So he says that he has drained to its dregs the cup of sorrow. You know, many uh, Christians believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. And in fact, those were his statements that he was, he became a sacrifice to die for the sins of the world. This statement here tells us that Baha'u'llah drained to its dregs 
the cup of sorrow that we might be filled with abiding joy. So it's kind of interesting to think about it being a spiritual and moral obligation of ours, therefore, to be able to reach that state of joy. So there's other writings that talk about happiness being our birthright. A lot of times, you know, it really depends what you believe. If you believe it is your birthright to be happy, and it's your birthright, it's your right as a result of the sacrifices of the messengers of God to be in a state of joy, then we have to do the necessary work of making the choices to be joyful, even in times of darkness. Abdul Baha even says it's easy to be happy when the seas are calm and everything is good. It's hard to be happy or in a state of joy when everything is tumultuous and difficult. But when you exist in a state of joy, no matter what's happening around you, you uplift others and you become a beacon for them. And I'm not talking about the kind of inappropriate, enthusiastic joy when somebody's suffering, but the kind that would allow you to become uh, one of those rainy day people to be with them in their difficulties and then help them to come along and feel the support that they could they could in order to reach a state of hope and a state of joy. Because that's really what our task is now. The world is going to go through many, many unbelievable things that are really um, so many calamities and difficulties. In fact, there's 13 or 14 things that um, the writings talk about will either accompany or preclude, uh, preclude a calamity that will purify the world. But we're not told to pay attention to these darknesses that are going to be happening. But we're told to actually be the source of joy and happiness and service to those around us. And in fact, we're told to not even think about those things, um, except to the degree that we could help them improve, but to really have as our, our mission or our purpose, our intention to be uplifting to those around us, our family members, our community members, those that we're privileged to be with. And that it's not always easy to figure out how to take someone from a state of sadness and feeling you know, that there's nothing much to live for and be able to help them come to embrace life again and put themselves back in motion so that they can continue to develop. My power by my life couldst thou but know the things sent down by my pen and discover the treasures of my cause and pearls of my mysteries, which lie hid in the seas of my names and in the goblets of my words. Thou wouldst for longing after his glorious and sublime kingdom lay down thy life in the path of God. Know thou that through my body, though my body be beneath the swords of my foes and my limbs be beset with incalculable afflictions, yet my spirit is filled with a gladness with which all the joys of the earth can never compare. So that from this, we recognize that another source of our joy is from the words of the creator, the words of the messengers of God. So whenever we go to those words, they will be a source of our calm and our serenity. No matter what is happening, if we can find in those words something that is a comfort to us or to those around us, it will be uplifting and that our spirits will also be filled with a gladness and a joy to know those truths, to be able to understand that they can improve things. And even if the peoples of the world want to attack the idea or not believe or not be part of it, Baha'u'llah says, behold how the diverse peoples and kindreds of the earth have been waiting for the coming of the promised one. No sooner, sorry, no sooner had he who is the son of truth been made manifest, than lo, all turned away from him, except them whom God was pleased to guide. And then he says, we dare not in this day lift the veil that concealeth the exalted station which every true believer can attain. For the joy which such a revelation must 
provoke, might well cause a few to faint away and die. So the distinction of being a, a believer that can turn themselves in faith towards the creator and help others experience a state of happiness or joy is a distinction that creates a station that's exalted above so many things in the world and it's the nature of that station were to be revealed some would faint away and die by just seeing them so the promise of what a true believer should become rests in the fact that we've got to be able to bring ourselves to this state of joy bring ourselves to this state of happiness and be grateful because the sign of spirituality is gratitude the sign of materialism is entitlement. So whatever we're dished out in our life, if we live in this state of gratitude and joy, then we're going to experience uh, joy no matter what we have to pass through. And just remember that if life is motion, then we will be passing through. It's not ever going to be uh, one state. And we'll always be developing to higher and higher levels. And our capacity to reach a state of joy in all circumstances and to help others do so will be greater. So these are, you know, this is, so the idea of experiencing joy giving us wings, uh, when we don't, you know, when we're in an environment where people are not backbiting, where people are encouraging each other, are trying to understand and help each other, are trying to bring each other happiness and joy, you don't even need to sleep as much you can think much clearer. It's not ever exhausting. It's always uplifting. In fact, you don't almost want to sleep because you're enjoying yourself so much. So if you've been in those environments, you realize that um, a lot of the things that we're suffering with in the world are because of what we're doing. Um, and you know, if the writings say that we cause nine tenths of our own problems, then we're gonna have to do a lot of internal work to be able to learn to turn our face towards his face, to turn our face towards his words and his prayers and his teachings and help others to feel encouraged. That would be really what the task is. So you've been patient and long suffering. You know that I offer an air miles program for spiritual points. I'll be giving them out at the end if you can endure all of this. And I hope that um, you can collect them and have some great flights of your own. Maybe we can have some questions if that works or comments. If anything has touched you or you might have been inspired to think of something, it'd be great to share them if that's good, but thank you very much. Thank you, Gord. There's a question that I'm going to ask you until the friends uh, would, uh, would raise their hands. Uh, the question is being happy is a choice we should make the answer to that question is absolutely, absolutely. And, and I, I'd say that because um, uh, lately I've been teaching the grade pens at Nancy Campbell, um, something about the capacity of the human mind. Um, you know, and if we ask ourselves when we wake up in the morning, um, what do we have to be happy about? Your mind will produce answers to that question. Um, and you'll start thinking of the things you have to be happy about. And if you can't change your life immediately, you know, like whatever you're going to do that day that doesn't allow you to think of anything that's going to raise up a spirit of happiness within you, then make a change, at least to give yourself something that's going to look forward, to help you to look forward to happiness. But we are the ones that determine how we feel. And we do that by the way we think. Because man's reality, Abdul Baha says, is his thought. So we have a great responsibility to manage our own state by managing our thoughts and by exposing our and enlightening our thought by the words and writings of God and prayers. And so if we're not, you know, I was telling the great tens, if you say three negative things in a row, take yourself out. Feed yourself get some rest, read some writings, do something, but you are in a bad state. So you just 
if we'd start recognizing our own responsibility uh, to, to look after how our own state is, then we start becoming a better influence to others. And so we have to be aware that it's possible for things to wear on us and that we might need certain things, but only we look after ourselves so that we could be a better service to others as well. But you have to look after those things too. So asking yourself those questions about how would I create a state of happiness your mind will produce answers because it's quite a powerful instrument and it will find, it will show you the ways. There is another question, but I'll wait. If the friends have any question, please go for it. And then I'll ask this question again a, a little later. Gary? In, a talk, in a talk, always everything seems simple. So I don't want to make it sound oversimplified, but in another way, it's a way of intensifying our commitment. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, friends. So I'll ask the question. You said man's reality is in his thoughts or his thoughts. Could you explain? Well, because... You know, um, the Baha'i writings say that um, faith is conscious knowledge. Um, and so when we receive the words of God in the books of God, um, that knowledge is very important to illumine our capacity to think and to tell us the direction, the directions or the principles that will lead us to the utmost development of ourselves and others around us. So um, when Abdul Baha says man's reality is his thought, um, you know, first we think of something and then we, you know, there's a, in some answered questions, there's an explanation of the process by which we go from thought to reality. Um, and so every development takes place through, first of all, thought, and then conversation, and then conversation uplifts thought if it's conversation that's positive, and then it leads to development, either personal development, community development, and always both are linked together, which the House of Justice says you can't develop in a vacuum. So it, the community is developing while you're developing, and now the salvation of humankind is the salvation of all. So I can't save myself. I can't save myself without helping others because we are each to be servants to others. And as we improve the human condition, then development takes place. So that's kind of what we mean when we say man's reality is his thought. Everything begins with our thought. Our thoughts create our feelings, not the other way around. But sometimes because we have negative thoughts, we create negative feelings. And then we say, I know it's true because this is how I feel, which is like reinforcing yourself in a downward spiral in order to, and then many people will say, well, I can't say that I'm happy when I'm not happy because then I feel like I'm fake. I would say, definitely say you're happy. Don't worry if you feel fake because you're out of touch with reality because you should be feeling happy and you need to be committed to that. And as you, start working on it, your mind, remember your mind is not going to make those judgments. You're gonna say, I am a happy being. I need to figure out what to do now to, to intensify my happiness. And if you tell yourself that, even when you're feeling down, you are going to come up with the, some very positive things. Don't let your, you know, your negative thoughts overcome the others. There is another question here, uh, which says, could a happy disposition be genetics? That's a good question. And what we're talking about in that question is, you know, uh, the relationship between the physical and the spiritual, right? And there definitely are, you know, we know about hormones, we know about uh, genetics, we know a lot more about illness and difficulties. But we also know that the human mind, actually, by believing things and continuing in a certain pattern, 
cuts new pathways in the brain biologically. So it's 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 an interesting thing. Which is shaped by what is? Uh, so yeah, we have Abdul Baha says we have um, genetics, and then we have acquired characteristics, and the acquired ones are actually by far by uh, very powerful ones. But it doesn't mean that the physical ones aren't real. Of course, the physical ones can become because we're tested in certain ways, and the physical realm here is the source of tests, as we just read about, right? Like all the material tests in the world are from the physical realm. So genetics certainly can play a part in that. Um, but really the way we work with genetics is we say that we, we do the best with what we have. We work with what we have. Um, and we actually don't succumb to the belief that the physical is greater than the spiritual because ultimately it never is. Um, although we may have to transcend our bodies as well. In other words, leave this realm. But it, the spiritual is, the material is a reflection of the spiritual, is what the writings say. So by keeping um, a positive spiritual um, attitudes and no matter what, it, facing whatever difficulties, that will always be the source of happiness and joy, even if we're suffering with tremendous physical difficulties. So it's not to minimize the fact that those are real things, but very often through our mind, we can actually control many, many things. If there's one thing that I saw in my experience with my wife who went through 18 years of <laughs> fighting cancer and um, being you know, as thin as a piece of paper, but then her will would be, okay, I'm going to, you know, I want to be there for my grandchildren or whatever it was that that was often a big motivator for her. And she would, you know, just rise again. My family started calling her the queen of recovery, you know, because she just, she would be, they would think that that was it. She's going, but then she would come back. And so, you know, I watched so many times um, the power of will over the physical body and on you know, and I don't think Ellen would have ever tried to present herself as someone that was, you know, really powerful. She she just really, um, you know, wanted to live and had spiritual, wanted to be with her grandchildren or children or help others. So I just think that we can't underestimate the power of human mind. Abdul Baha, you know, in that time that we went through those difficulties. We had many predictions from doctors about how long she was going to live. Once I was given three days, once I was given two years, once we were given, she was given one year. So, you know, she lived 18 years. So one thing that became very clear to me was uh, I found this writing about the Baha where he said, the doctors prescribe the remedy, but God decides the healing. So to me, there's a very important distinction here. He's re reserving a lot of space for him to work and to do miraculous things if he wishes. And so we always have to, in my mind, realize that we are not the ones in control and, and that ultimately the creator has us as instruments and he has his purpose. Thanks, Gord. Ilona, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, Gord. Um, your so good to see you, Ilona. <laughs> Wonderful talk. Um, I want to ask you about, well, I mean, you're alluding to the suffering of others in talking about your wife. And, you know, like an hour ago, I was watching the news. And yeah. every, every day, how, how do we handle the things that we see on the news that is so painful. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very um, powerful question. I think when, um, when we think about the suffering of the children and the suffering of the families and we realize um, that humanity is going through this dark heart um, and it's, we're still in this dark heart 
um, of the transition from what I would call delinquent adolescence uh, to, to maturity. And we can know that this is the, you know, this is the course that we're going through. And I say delinquent adolescence because we didn't have to suffer like this, but because we chose not and we choose not to follow the guidance of God and the principles of God in the way in which we relate to each other, then we're going to have to have, it, it's going to result in more extreme suffering. And we're seeing that. We're seeing, um, we're seeing that the problem with a delinquent adolescent is that they've disconnected their relationship between uh, those who love them and their parents and others and replaced it with something that is actually, um, you know, outrageous and unsustainable and very often harmful to others around them. And so we're kind of seeing that running rampant, you know, and that's not new, unfortunately, it's not new. As we all know, it's been the history of humanity. And I, I remember, I take some comfort in knowing that um, Enoch Alingo, one of the hands of the cause, when he was talking to um, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, and he said, you know, in the future, um, they're going to look at what has happened in the world and they're going to see uh, human beings. And he talked about other beings from other realms coming um, from other planets and so on and regarding us as barbarians. And at the time, Enoch Linga was disturbed by the fact that he was talking so kind of disparagingly about uh, humans. And he, he said to him at the time, well, you know, um, why Why would they think that? And he said, because you kill each other for land. You'll actually kill each other for earth or dirt. And he said, that's just one of many things and, and barbaric things are done to each other. But that's going to change. Um, and so my view, Ilona, is that I cannot look, Abdul Baha says, it, the secret to this life is to meditate upon the future life. So you can think about that in relationship to ourselves. We're going to be much happier in the realms beyond this one, according to what the writings tell us. But also the future of humanity, the future life of humanity is not going to be doing what we're doing now. And I feel like the only real hope for my thought is to believe that we are going to evolve out of this. We are going to find ways of interacting and solving problems that won't ever allow these things to happen again. And we think sometimes that we've got it, but then it breaks out in a new way because ultimately humanity has not accepted its fundamental oneness. And that has to be that fundamental oneness has to be at the level that your baby is my baby. The baby in um, Palestine is my baby. The baby in Israel is my baby. And if that baby's suffering, my baby's suffering. And when we can feel it at that level, we're going to behave differently. But at this point, we, we have disconnected ourselves at the level from our feelings that atrocities can occur and people can actually convince themselves that those atrocities are okay because of some other reason. And so I think until we evolve more, it's going to be painful. And my hope is to set my eyes on the future and to comfort all those around me that I can comfort um, and help to realize that this is a struggle and the learned people of the earth are going to have to struggle and strain in order for us to move as much as we can in the directions that we know the creator wants us to go, no matter what's going on around us. And don't ever, you know, if there ever was a time for spirituality and the view of humanity that is about its oneness, this is the time. And it, it will never be stronger than in this darkest part of what's going on in the world. I don't know if that, makes sense but i'm thank, sure you thank think. you so much because this is a topic of conversation with many people and 
you've given me some some <laughs> very good talking points. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Yeah, we have to look to the future. And the other part was, I remember when I first heard about the the faith, you know, I was not interested in religion. I didn't really want a new religion. I had decided to be a Baha'i and I went to work the next day and I told my brother, if anybody asked me to talk about this, I'm going to resign immediately because I have no... Um, <laughs> I was so uncomfortable with the idea of being religious or spiritual. And I remember um, thinking, being overwhelmed by just one day at work. And I went home and I said, you know, what is the point? Like the world is in such a terrible condition. Like really, what am I going to do that's going to make any difference? And, you know, people don't want faith. They don't even know. They don't even think they want to be spiritual. Like I was, you know, obviously not the best state as you can hear and i remember him saying you know um well you have to sweep off your own back step before you go and look at somebody else's back step and um that was a very simple thing to say but you know he he basically said you 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 know it doesn't matter what other people are doing you have to be able to just do what is the right thing to do and keep going according to principle rather than because we see darkness around us abandoning all those things we know to be true in our soul um, because uh, that's that's really what will cause humanity to uh, evolve is our commitment to truth and to spiritual principles of our oneness Thank you, Gord. There are a few questions. Yes, the answer is yes. If your camera is closed, you can always ask questions. Oh, Clover, yes, with camera open. Perfect. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'd just like to ask a question. You mentioned the barbaric um, things that man does. Would you say it's the nature of man because they have the ability to think pure thoughts? They can be happy, they can be sad. So would you say it's the nature of man, why they're doing what they're doing, and it has to be fulfilled? That's a very good question. I think it's a question that humanity has asked itself many, many times. And in the face of such ugliness and horrific behavior, one might believe, or one could come to that conclusion. Uh, but what the Baha'i teachings make very clear is that we have this dual nature of being able to be animalistic and even worse than animals or divine and willing to be sacrificing everything about ourselves for the sake of each other as the messengers of god have done um, but our true nature is asserted to be noble and of this higher nature of the demonstration of virtues and qualities our problem is in our system of education and I'm not talking just about our schools, but I'm talking about everything that humanity is learning from and about and who it's learning from. Instead of actually taking the divine lessons from the messengers of God and understanding that they're in a different category altogether and understanding that they can't be half right, those things are absolutely truth purified. And then the application, and this is the part, we've been pretty good at preaching those things to each other, but we haven't been so good at figuring out how to live them. And I think the level of discussion now that's really happening in study circles, for example, in the Baha'i community is really to look at these writings and teachings and really trying to figure out how do we apply these in our life? How do we put them into real action? Stop trying to convince each other that they're right. Because truths we know are, you know, like we have the capacity as humans to recognize truth, but to apply truth and to choose truth over patterns that for centuries have been developed that have led to a civilization that looks like ours is going to be a much more difficult task. So if we have enough people doing something, one could say that it's in our nature. Or one can say there's a whole bunch of people that got it wrong. 
And, you know, when truth comes in, it is its own power. It will start to exercise an influence. And the more people that understand truth about something, like about our oneness, how many theories are there about uh, the diversity of human beings that is so problematic until humanity comes to this understanding of this oneness, it's not going to be possible to convince people that it's not in our nature to be prejudiced or to hate one another or to do horrific things to each other. It's only going to be possible when we come to the full realization that this oneness means that your baby is my baby and my baby is your baby and nothing else is going to replace that belief or that feeling. So I would say, no, it's not our nature to be violent and horrible, um, but those, those anti-qualities or those lack of qualities have been deployed far more in the past because we haven't actually exercised our capacity to strengthen our spiritual nature very well. In fact, humanity for the most part continues to reject its spiritual nature. And in the Century of Light, the House of Justice publication, uh, there's a line in there that says, "We humanity is stubbornly resisting the spiritual nature of the problem. And I think that's, we cannot find our true nature until we understand that we are spiritual beings first, and that that's the highest truth, and that we have this tremendous capacity to um, reflect all of the divine attributes to each other and to put those and deploy those for the well-being of humanity. That's what our nature is. Our nature is to become a pure mirror to reflect the qualities of God to each other. And the more that happens in any environment, the more illumined it becomes, the more joyful we are, the more progress we make, the more invention and creation and progress takes place. So I know that's a long answer, but we have to remain, you know, and no one knows this more than a mother. You know, I was sitting with my 89 year old mother and she said to me the other day, I think I'm, I, she may not be happy that I'd say this, but she said, I think I'm just going to go to hell. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> she had you know, she's the one that has over 50 grandchildren <laughs> and all these children. And, and I said, what are you saying? She said, no, I think I'm going to be going down. I said, mom, why would you say that? She said, well, I don't think I was really a good mother. And I said, I have not met a mother that thinks that they were a good mother. <laughs> and I said, but, but think about your mothering. Because I used to do this with my wife as well. <laughs> You have, have you ever advised your children to be bad and unruly and try to create difficulties? She said, well, of course not. And I said, have you ever told them that they should choose some kind of horrible activity or vice instead of a quality or a virtue? Well, I would never do that, she said. So I said, you spent your entire life making sure that all of these people are turning to qualities and virtues and you think God is going to send you to hell. Like, what would be happening there? We don't even believe in hell. And then I said to her, if your daughter was here in this chair and she did something horribly wrong, would you forgive her? And she said, well, of course I'd forgive her. She's my daughter. And I said, so are you better than God? And she, she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, if you can forgive your daughter for whatever shortcoming you might have had, God can forgive that you know like he's better than us like we're good at forgiving too obviously we do it but you know it's an interesting thing that somehow we we also it doesn't help our spirituality to um to overemphasize our shortcomings or to berate ourselves about difficulties we really have to stop doing that abdul baha says it's not fitting for the soul it's not fitting for the social the, the reality of the soul we have to recognize that the soul is this excellent gem that's just illumining the world illuminating the world and you know mothers know this they see the potential all the time fathers know it as well but mothers do most of the heavy lifting in this situation and they're constantly this tremendous power so sorry to take that little diversion but i but i feel like 
in the long run, it's going to be this tremendous gift of um, mothers and families of supporting these qualities and spirituality, no matter what, that will cause this evolution to happen. It's not going to happen any other way. And talking about our struggle is really important. Not putting it out there like we're already there. We're not already there. We're, we're struggling to demonstrate these qualities over and over in very complex situations that almost seem hopeless some of the time. But we believe that if we talk about it, we'll figure it out. I hope that's okay, Clover. I have a few questions here, and I know that there is a hand up. Clover, darling, would you like to ask any other questions? Do you have any other questions, or shall I go ahead with the questions I have? Did you say Clover? Yes. Oh, no, I do. I don't. Thank okay. You. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, one question is, how can we change this education? You talked about this education, which which creates, uh, you know, a misunderstanding about our nature. Well, I think the answer to that is, uh, Nancy Campbell, we say we have, we have the twin pillars of moral education and academic education. Um, and the writings make very clear that um, the most important education is moral and spiritual education. And there are universal morals and spiritual principles, so we don't need to get into whose who's faith or whose religion. You know, the moral principles are vitally important for human beings to learn how to apply them. So at Nancy Campbell, we, you know, every lesson has moral moral capabilities we're trying to develop and academic capabilities. These have to become inseparable. And again, mothers know this. Mothers constantly are appealing to both in the development of the child. And somehow um, at the school level, we divorced ourselves from the, the understanding that um, moral and character education is so important. But in actual fact, it is the shaping of attitudes, like moral development shapes attitudes. You can, you can uh, if, if I look at um, what a child produces, I can tell you their qualities. I'm sure you could too, um, because these are so linked. So when a child is morally responsible and thoughtful and caring and um, all of the other virtues and qualities you know, you see that reflected in the academic work. But the writings say if a child is academically advanced but morally not developed, then that child can become a cause of harm to society. Um, where if their character is developed, even if they're not academically developed, they will never be a cause of harm to society. So this divorce that we have from these two realms uh, is really the, the essence of the problem. And you can see that, you know, we've had now three PhD studies on the school and the students and so on. And each one talks about how the students have purpose and meaning because of this connection, right? You want to learn certain things because when you know your purpose and the meaning, it inspires you to know what you have to know. It, it, helps, you, it helps you find what we said at the beginning of the talk, your sphere of usefulness, and you start to realize what you have talents in, and you want to develop those for the sake of your contribution and being able to make that. So to me, the revamping of education is going to have to be in getting the systems together to identify what are the moral and ethical principles that we really have to understand, number one being our fundamental oneness, which we're gradually becoming committed to even though we may not be demonstrating it in every day, but we're, in principle, we're committed to it, which is the first level at the level of thought. And what we're putting out there, we're committed to these standards. And as we um, learn how to realize those standards, we'll see evolution taking place in, in society. 
Thank you so much. I'll ask Mahvash Khanum, please go ahead. I have a few more questions and it's 8.20. Welcoming, doc Welcoming Dr. Valerie Don. Thanks for joining us. Please go ahead, Mahvash. Uh, merci, Furja. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gor. As usual, wonderful, warm, and uh, lovely. I enjoyed it very much, all your good points and the positiveness that you always have. It reminded me of our fireside in Burlington with you and ah, oh, so good, so good. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I, I just, uh, when we were talking about uh, positiveness and looking at our own steps, or as your brother said, back step to, and look at the, as we say, the bigger picture, uh, that is so, so true and so important. Otherwise, you would be lost. And I I, I thought um, a good example is the sacrifice of the Baha'is in Iran. For 45 years, they, they are in it, in and out of prison, out or in, they are in very hardship situation. We all know about everything. Their life is not a regular life at all, but they keep sacrificing and being positive. And their treatment <clears throat> against the treatment of the others that you're cruel and all that is kindness, being positive, and be loving. And, yeah. and that is paying off. You hear it. You hear that is paying off and that i always remind myself an example that we we shouldn't uh, look at the it's very sad of course very sad the situation but should look at the bigger picture and that's a good example for us that give us hope that uh, kindness and being good and looking for the better future for humankind is the yep. way to look at anyhow thank you I yeah, I, yeah, I was concerned about the, you know, I heard on CBC News that the Nobel Peace Prize winner that mm -hmm. uh, from Iran had uh, her husband had stated that she uh, had, you know, was accepting this Nobel Peace Prize, but now she was beginning a hunger strike in mm -hmm. in uh, solidarity with the Baha'i community, mm -hmm. which actually you know, deeply concerned me because I thought the the hatred is so much that she'll probably starve to death. Um, because I don't think I don't think the regime will respond uh, to to that. But it's fascinating to see that this woman who has worked so hard to uplift the uh, the women's women's condition in Iran and suffered greatly because of it and still in prison um, is now going to take on this activity, which is a to me a demonstration of she doesn't have to do that, right? It's a demonstration of this idea of oneness and solidarity between people, but it will have an impact. And you're right, the suffering of people to realize truths are, is going to be great. It has been, and it will be for some time to come. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Lovely. There, there is a question here uh, that says, why do members of these religious leaders kill? I thought killing is forbidden in all religions. Well, that's a good question. But again, to me, it has to do with the application of the spiritual principles that um, the prophets of God have given us. And, you know, um, I don't think the killing, frankly, has anything to do uh, with religion. It has to do with fanaticism and it has to do with other motives. I remember Bill Hatcher saying, whenever ideas become more important than people, then that's fanaticism. It's not idea, ideology. Um, and I think it's a very interesting standard. Um, of course, 
Um, I also remember when Mona was being interrogated, the 16 year old being interrogated by the, the mullah. And he said to her at one point, because she said, I'm not going to recant my faith and you might as well, you know, just do what you're going to do. And he said to her, so I see you believe in suicide. Um, you know, kind of turning around the question, which is what happens when people want to pursue insanity. So he said to her, I see you believe in suicide. And she said, so I see you believe in murder, which was aptly put and putting the thing where it should have been. It wasn't, it's never the victim that's trying to make this thing happen. It's always the fanatical element that wants to do it. So I would say, the, to answer the question, there is no place for, for that. But um, we also cannot not uphold what it is we believe in. And I think the biggest prejudice that's going to have to be faced by humanity in the future, the more difficult one, the less visible one, is going to be freedom to believe. And it's because humanity hasn't learned that people do always have to have choice because we're noble beings and we have to choose the truth of things and not choose to destroy people because they don't believe like we believe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you spoke about self-destructiveness. Could you elaborate? Um, yeah, I think, I think we have to see that, again, going back to this idea of us having this dual nature and always needing to have the right to choose because it was created. I usually use the example of saying, okay, in the Baha'i teachings, we are to educate all of our children in all the spiritual um, understandings of every religion, like of all the religions, so that they are prepared um, to know what is the truth. And then at the age of 15, they um, are expected, which we consider the age of maturity, to decide whether or not what they believe in. Um, we don't like put the question in a direct harsh way, but the truth of the matter is after 15, a person is accountable to the creator, according to the Baha'i teachings. And that right is upheld. Even God upholds the right for a person not to believe in him. So important is choice. You know, if anyone could force people to believe, it would be God. Um, but, but he preserves the right to choose. He wants us to believe because we want to believe, not because we're forced to believe. And this principle, therefore, becomes still the most important one. Now, in choices, there's always responsibility and there's rights. The right is that you have the right to choose. The responsibility is to really think through what good choices are, what are healthy choices, what are choices that lead to our upliftment or our abasement, Baha'u'llah says. Are we trying to abase ourselves, bring ourselves down, or are we trying to bring ourselves up? Are we trying to eat in a way that will destroy our bodies or eat in a way that will help us? And sometimes we, and, and this is never an exact science, right? So in other words, people sometimes make the wrong choice, sometimes make the right choice, but we're looking at overall, the bulk of the choices need to be in a constructive developmental way. So rather than believing in this dichotomizing way that you're either good or bad, in, according to the teachings, a soul is evolving, it's developing, it will likely make mistakes, not even intending to make mistakes, but that it will continue to evolve from one state of positiveness to another. But we can do certain things that destroy ourselves, physically and spiritually. And so we really have to be thinking about what do I need to know in order to develop my reality, both spiritually and materially. So, I, you know, there are destructive and there are constructive choices. Those are really the two choices. Thank you so much, friends. If you 
have more questions, please write it for me. No problem. Uh, Gary, please go ahead, Gary. Well, thank you. I, I'll try and make this quite short. Uh, just firstly, if I could, um, I just wanted to say hello first to a dear, dear old friend. Uh, she's not old. Uh, uh, Brenda, Brenda Cotris. I just yes, yes. Many we've had many good times together serving the faith. I wanted to uh, just. I was thinking of uh, you. Reminded me, uh, uh, Gord, of um, something that was really uh, affected me in my life, and I was thinking of your comments about joy. Um, as, as as the Baha'is are aware that we, we don't have ministers and so on. And when it comes to marriage, someone is appointed by the local assembly to witness a marriage on behalf of the assembly and on behalf of the government and sign the marriage license. And um, when I was in Winnipeg, um, I... I, I had that um, opportunity to do that. And um, in my life, as we've all been to many weddings with very large and small and some with uh, lots of color and, and uh, wonderful surroundings, I went to this little house in the south uh, east side of Winnipeg. It was a little wooden World War II home, quite small. I knocked on the door, they invited me in, and I was in the living room with the mother and the father, as the mother and fathers, and a couple of sisters and brothers. And they were while watching TV, and I sat down and I watched TV with them, I wondering what was happening. And the TV show was ended and someone says, well, let's go, let's go out the back. And we went out the back into a little wee yard, um, 20 feet by 30 feet, and uh, with an enormous maple tree um, towards the back of the yard with a rope hanging from it and a tire on the rope. And the tree dominated the backyard such that there was no grass. So we were standing on dirt. And all there was was a was a um, a card table with a beautiful white cloth on it. And the family gathered around the table. And the the young fellow was marrying a woman, a young woman who had a child and they lost their husband. And the ceremony started and each person spoke with so much love and so much caring for each and every person one at a time and they went around each commenting on each other. Um, there was such joy. The love brought such joy. Um, tears were running from my eyes uncontrollably. I've never experienced as much joy in my life. And I'll never forget that moment. And these were Baha'is. Anyways, I thought I'd share that story. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thanks, Gary. It was very touching. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, it's 8.30. Uh, we usually, between 8.30 and 9, we say prayers. But uh, welcoming Nancy Ackerman, my old, old friend. Uh, so uh, 
if you have any more questions please please write it in the chat or you can ask questions uh, this will be our last fireside of 2023 we will start the first thursday of january clover it was wonderful to have you here thank you thank you so much uh, if, if you wish uh, you can send me your email and i will send you invitations uh friends if there is no more questions maybe we can move into the devotional part word words fail me to thank you enough for your participation during such a very very busy time thank you for for your amazing talk as always we really really appreciate your commitment to this gathering and all the other gatherings such as this uh if friends have no more question miss maybe mr perimal would start prayers Gord, do you have anything else to say no thank you to everybody it was um really enjoyable to be together with everyone have a happy holiday season whatever that means to you Uh, by the way, I just wanted you to know that all these uh, Thursday evening forums are under Baha'is of Oakville YouTube. So uh, if if you log into uh, Oakville Baha'is, I'm sorry, uh, it will show you YouTube and you will see about three, four years worth of, of firesides there uh, but uh, oh I, i'll do my best to send it to you uh friends we'll move into our devotional part thanking Gord very very much mr perimot 